So today we're going to visit um, Western Sicily. I'm going to talk about a work of art and then I'm going to make two recipes that originated in Western Sicily. So let's get started. I'm going to share my screen. So give me a second while, so I can show you kind of a slideshow. So give me a second to um, get that set up. Technology is not my forte, which is why Lorenzo's here. Portion of screen, Giusto Lorenzo. Eccolo. Pero, okay, how does that look? Y'all can see yourselves, is that correct? Lorenzo, c'è modo che io posso evitare quello? We can see that, Elaine. Looks okay. Fine. All right, let's go with this. And then if I need to make an adjustment, I will. So this is obviously a map of Italy. I'm coming to you from this little circle up at the top. That is the area of Tuscany where I am sitting right now where I live and it's just southwest of the city of Florence. So we're going to take a quick look at that. And then we're going to jump down to Sicily, Western Sicily, the, the little, the bigger pink circle at the bottom of that map, okay? So I'm in Tuscany, southwest of Florence. And here's an example of what the countryside around here looks like. It's very, very rural. As you can see, there's lots of cultivation of um, grapes and olives, but there's also quite a bit of forest and even some just uncultivated fields. And then the hillsides typically have medieval castles on top. You can kind of see one in the distance over here. And I live on the property of one of these castles. So this is where I live. Um, this on the left, it's not my house, that's my landlord's house. The Count and Countess live in the castle. And then I live, if you look in the slide on the right, that photograph was taken from the castle tower looking down. And if you see in the bottom corner of that picture, that little group of houses down there, that's called the Borgo. That's where I live. So these are um, homes where the tenant farmers lived. The count and countess back in the medieval period were given a large um, portion of land. They had to protect Florence. So they were given, in return for all of this land, they had to gather an army and protect Florence. They, they were also in charge of protecting a commercial trade route that went through here. And then on that land that they were given, they had tenant farmers. So they produced sort of the same things they produce today, olive oil and wine, and probably some other agricultural products like cheese and prosciutto and that kind of thing. So this is what those farmer houses look like. And this is actually where I live. So um, the Farmhouses have been turned into um, rentals for people like me. And this is my front door. So I'm coming to you from right here. Um, all right, so let's jump down to Sicily. So you can see in that little inset that Sicily is the uh, biggest island in the Mediterranean. It's also the biggest uh, region of Italy. So it's quite large, although the distance is probably don't seem so, so grand to y'all in Australia because I know y'all have um, y'all have lots of space down there. Um, to just give you an example, from Palermo, which is the capital, right up here, down to Mazzara del Vallo that we're about to talk about. It's a sort of an hour and 20 minute drive, so it's not that huge. It's actually kind of a fun trip and you can, you can make um, a good tour of the island and see a lot. So we're going to talk about Mazzara del Vallo, which is the town on the southwest coast that's highlighted in red. But first, I'm going to just give you an idea of Sicily. Sicily is very, very rich culturally, and it's very, the natural beauty is amazing, and it's very hard to sum up in a few words or even a few images. So I really have kind of a random selection of images just to kind of show you what this island is like. It's really particular. This is a Catholic church that was built in the Norman period but they use Saracen architects. So you get those wonderful red domes and that tracery effect at the top, which is so um, delicate and ornamental, but also kind of gives it an exotic feel. This is the goddess of grain. She's very important from very ancient times on. Sicily is famous for its um, wine. This is a vineyard on Mount Etna and foods. This is a photograph of my aunt Francesca in Poggioriale di Sicilia. I don't know if we have any, we don't have any Poggioriale people on the line. They were invited to. 
maybe they're all busy this evening. Um, so that's my aunt in the background. In the foreground, you can see the greens called tenarumi, and those are the greens of the kakutsa squash, which is what you see on the right. That's this very long, skinny um, kind of a squash. And it's a funny thing, the greens actually have more flavor than the squash does, but the squash gets candied, like you do, it's candied fruit, and they call it zucata, and that's actually what's used in a lot of these desserts. They stir that into the ricotta. So when you see those little green bits of candied fruit, it's often the um, candied uh, kakutsa squash. And just a few more images of Sicily, so beautiful. This is the cathedral in Palermo. This is the Quattro Canti in Palermo, very majestic. And then Palermo is just full of quirky little things like this. Just somebody left some lemons in their grocery cart. Out in the countryside buying greens. This is a guy who foraged some greens for us. Now we're moving into Mazzara del Vallo. Beautiful Baroque architecture as well in Mazzara. And here we are back at the map. So we've moved down to Mazzara del Vallo, that town on the southwest coast that's highlighted in red. This is a view of Mazzara from above. Um, Mazzara is not, um, usually on a tourist itinerary, but it's a really fun visit. The older part of town, the historic center, is on the left of that canal that you see over here. There are Norman ruins down there. The center of town, the ancient center, is a Arabic Medina. There's a Baroque convent where the nuns are cloistered and still make desserts, kind of like some of the ones we're going to make today, but even better, they're amazing. These, the nuns down there are specialized in making desserts. It's really fun to go. You have to go into this cloistered monastery and they have the grate and you talk through the grate and you order your dessert. You know those wheels where they used to put abandoned babies? They actually spin the wheel around and out come your cookies. It's a really fun visit. Also in Mazzara is a museum devoted to a single work of art, which is the work of art we're about to talk to, talk about, excuse me. I wish, I wish we could talk to him because he would have a lot to tell us. That would be really fun. That's like dream um, dinner party invite. So the other factor here with Mazzara del Vallo is this is the home to the largest fishing fleet, commercial fishing fleet in the Mediterranean. So the boat over here called Capitan Chicho is one of the pescarecci or commercial fishing boats that goes out and fishes in the Mediterranean. And you can see there um, the crew in the 1990s where these men you can see over here on the right. And this is their fishing grounds. They would take out the Capitan Chicho and they would go fishing in the Canale di Sicilia, which is that um, area of sea between Sicily and Tunisia. And they often found, sometimes they would go to a certain spot and their nets would snag on something. And they actually tried to avoid going there until one day they were blown in by a storm and they were in these, um, this area of these fishing grounds where they knew their nets used to snag. Their nets got snagged and they pulled their net up and there was a leg, a bronze leg, part of a sculpture was in the fishing net. So there was, it was from the knee down, the knee down in the foot. And they thought, okay, this is interesting. When they got back to land, they called the authorities, they turned it over to um, the Ministry of Fine Arts, which is very nice of them because sometimes people haul these things up in their fishing nets and then put it on the mantelpiece at home. So these guys were on the up and up. They called the Ministry of Fine Arts and they turned over this piece of a leg. And they remembered exactly where they were and they thought, if there's a leg down there, well then the rest of that statue's down there too. And one day we're gonna get it. So they kept going back to these fishing grounds. So here's Capitan Chicho the crew, here are the fishing grounds. One year after they found the leg, March of 1998, their nets snag, they pull the nets up, and this is what they found. So this is a bronze sculpture. It's been underwater for 3,000 years. It's covered with barnacles and all sorts of things that all the little sea, sea animals who've set up shop there on, um, on and on top of and inside of this uh, statue. Here's what he looks like in the back. I'm trying to get us out of the way here. There we go. Um, more out of the way. They keep, uh, Lorenzo, I mean, may I come? Me, what I faccio qui? Me da fastidio questa cosa. Y'all can see his hair. I'm sorry, I'm just going to move us out of the way. See his hair blowing in the wind? That's kind of a clue. We're going to come back to that. And then they had the Cinderella moment where they said, okay, is this the same, is this the same statue whose leg we found? And this, look at the bottom of this slide. They're attaching the leg and the leg fits. 
So yes, the leg that was on the bottom of the ocean that came up in 1997 is part of the statue that these guys found then in 1998. So this thing gets sent off for restoration and comes back and it looks like this. Um, so this is a very interesting work of art from um, the place where it was found, we have nothing. It was found so far underwater that they can't send divers down there. So we don't have anything that would help us locate this in a place in time. We have no sort of extenuating circumstances that would prove to us where this thing came from, where it was going, why it was on a boat. So we're just gonna, everything we know about the statue comes from the statue itself. So if we look at it really carefully, um, scholars have identified this as a Greek work of art dating to the early Hellenistic period, which is uh, late fourth century BC. So we know this thing comes from the late fourth century BC and it was made by a Greek artist. And it is of such high quality. It's a spectacular, spectacular work of art. It is of such high quality that they believe perhaps it came from the workshop of Praxiteles. We, can, we don't know that. Praxiteles was one of the most um, well-known um, Greek sculptors of the Hellenistic period. So we don't know who made this. It's not signed, we can't prove that. But the quality level is in fact, like something that would come out of the workshop of Praxiteles. So we know that. We also know that it's an original. Um, most Greek sculpture that we know about, we know about in Roman marbles. Romans copied Greek statues. They liked them, they copied them, they put them in their villas. Most of the Greek statues were in metal like this. This is a, a metal alloy, it's bronze. And bronze is kind of, um, it's kind of a precious metal in a certain sense. So if you think about a statue like this, after 300 years, when it's no longer fashionable, the person who commissioned it is dead 300 years ago, the statue's probably broken. These things got melted down because they wanted to reuse the metals. So a lot of these original Greek statues do not exist. We know, we know a little bit about them because there are copies in marble, but you, you know a copy never quite has all of the same subtleties and beauty that an original does. So the, th the fact that this guy was in a shipwreck really saved him so that we can actually see this amazing work of art. It would have been lost otherwise. He probably would have been melted down. He though was under the ocean for um, 3,000 years, so we still get to see them. So what we know about this thing is it's an original Greek bronze statue from the late fourth century BC. But who is it and what is he doing? Scholars, when they first looked at it, they looked at that hair. I'm gonna move us out of the way again. Look at the hair blowing in the wind. So they thought, well, maybe he's the god of the wind, Iolo. And they looked a little bit more carefully and they looked at his ears. Look at the ears, those are pointy pointy horse's ears. So this guy had the ears of a horse and he also had the tail of a horse. See the hole right here? That's where the tail was inserted. So a young man in this time period, fourth century BC, a young man represented with the ears and tail of a horse was a satyr. So we know we have a satyr. And now what's he doing? three of his limbs were missing. So he's got one leg that's kicked out behind him very energetically. And we can see, even though the limbs are missing, we can see from the way his shoulders are placed that his arms were outstretched. So we have a satyr who's kind of doing this, he's got his arms out and he's kicking a leg back behind him and his head's over here, what is going on? Scholars, ar archeologists who study this kind of stuff immediately thought of that. So this is an example of an image of a dancing satyr um, Greek art from this period is of these things. You see it a lot on um, served on sarcophagi or painted onto a vase. And what this is, is a dancing satyr who is in the cult of the god Dionysus. Dionysus was the god of vegetation and wine. The satyr here is a kind of, a, he's sort of a spirit of the natural world and he's connected with Dionysus. And what he's doing is performing a ritual dance that any worshiper, even the, all worshipers of Dionysus participated in, they call them the Dionysian rites. And what they did was performed a kind of a dance. So what they're doing is they're, this man, satyr, is holding the pelt of a panther, which is the symbol of Dionysus. He's holding a two-handled cantharos, which is a drinking cup, and he's holding a tirsos, 
which has a, a staff with a pine cone on the end, and he's actually looking up at that pine cone. So this is a reconstructive drawing of our guy. There you go. Our guy most likely was holding on to those attributes. That's what the satyrs in um, the Danes and Rites do. All of them are, have these attributes, so we are pretty sure that our guy also had those. So what they're doing is, in the cult of Dionysus, in order to um, go into basically commune, commune, commune with the divinity, these guys would go into a meditative state. They would induce themselves into a trance-like state by drinking diluted wine, water mixed with wine out of their cantaros. Um, the Greeks did not look fondly on inebriation. So they drank wine, but it was always diluted. And so he's drunk a little bit of his diluted wine and he's fixed his gaze on the pine cone on the end of his tirsos and he starts to dance in a rhythmic motion going around in a circle. And he's doing that in order to go into kind of like transcendental medita meditation. He's meditating, he's transcending beyond the earthly world and kind of going into the spiritual realm. What he's basically doing is turning inward and finding serenity by putting himself in touch with the spiritual the spiritual realm. And a similar um, figure that does that are dervishes. So he's literally whirling like a dervish. We've all seen these images. They're quite, um, these guys spin in order to go into a meditative state and they spin so quickly. You can see how their skirts are flying out around them. Well, this guy doesn't have any skirts. His hair is flying around. We've already seen that. His hair is moving in the wind. Um, his tail actually is a little bit placed a little bit off center. The Greeks do this. It's called trump loi. The Greeks were perfectly capable of putting that hole in the center, which is right about here. They moved it slightly over to the left because that makes your eye think that that figure is moving. That hair is wishing over there. The tail is slightly off center. And even his private parts are blowing in the wind. Okay, so he's really got some spin going as he's doing this dance. So what he's doing, like I said, is going into this trance. And so he's moving in a circle. And it's really cool when you're in front of this work of art, um, and this is a characteristic of Hellenistic art, there is no one single vantage point. Every vantage point is interesting. When you look at art from before this period, usually there's a statue who's just standing there like this, and you stand in front of him, and you look at it, and you move on. This guy, you have to walk around him. And I'm sorry we're looking at it on a computer screen, but it's better than not looking at it at all. So let's move around the um, sculpture. You can, you can move around it, and it's as though he's spinning in front of you. So let's just take a look at his movement. So he has spun. He is spinning around. His muscles are in tension. He is really, he's got his arms out. He's holding all of this stuff. He's got one leg kicked out behind him. He's doing a very energetic dance. I and mean, you can see his back muscles, his glutes, his legs. And then look at his head. His head is just abandoned over to the side and his gaze is very soft. His eyes look really goofy right now because they don't have their irises. This is inlaid alabaster and the irises would have been inlaid obsidian, but they're still on the, the seabed. But his, his gaze is actually quite relaxed. So in contrast to the tense muscles of this dancing body, the head is relaxed, the gaze is soft, his cheeks are soft, his jaw is soft, his jaw is so relaxed, his mouth is parted a little bit. His mouth is slightly open. So he has really turned inward and found serenity and transcended into the spiritual realm. And I originally chose this work of art to talk about because I absolutely love it. But this period, we've all been in some version of lockdown. We've had a lot of time to spend with our own thoughts. And it would be great if we could all use that positively and turn inward and find serenity and kind of deal with this horrible situation that's going on by um, kind of again, just kind of using our brain and just turning inward and finding that calmness. So I hope that for all of us. And if that doesn't work, we can just eat some desserts. Um, so we're gonna talk about two desserts. I chose these two desserts because they have the same filling, okay? So it's really easy to make them both because the filling is the exact same thing. These desserts are iconic desserts of Sicily. You find them all over Sicily all the time, but they originated in Western Sicily and were used kind of for feast days. Um, these are cannoli, which everybody knows about. 
We're also going to make cassatas. This is a layer cake that has the same filling in it. The sweetened ricotta cheese filling. It's not actually cheese. We'll talk about that in a second. And then kind of decorated wildly. This green almond paste um, border and then all of these candied fruits. Just really fun to make. Just you know, use your imagination and creativity and make these beautiful cakes. Um, so that's what we're about to do. These are the ingredients I'm going to use. I'm going to change my camera position and then we're going to start making desserts. So hang on one second while I pick my computer up. I'm going to go over here. Elaine, yeah. um, we, are we making along with you or are we just mostly watching you? We loved the talk on the sculpture. It was very beautiful. Okay, you're watching right now because I have an art to keep time a little bit. Hang on, I need to plug in. To keep time, um, to keep you, not to not keep you here all day long. Um, I've made some things ahead of time. So I'm gonna show you how to do this and then you, and send you the recipe and you can do this on your own. Okay, okay. cool, thank you. So leva un po' lo schermo, Elaine. Sì, ma stavo cercando di collegare il cavetto, ma non funziona, quindi va bene nulla. All right, unshare, stop share. Okay, y'all are back to me. Yes, Ready? we can see with. your table. And yes. Okay. And the corner of Perfect. your face. Okay, what's important though is that you can see me. Can you see me here? My head's not cut off. My head's cut off. Okay, not perfetto, Elaine. Guarda perfetto. Faccio così. Va bene così. Okay, perfetto. All right, so I'm going to start by making the filling of um, both the cannoli and the passata. And so the main ingredient here is ricotta, which is literally a byproduct of the cheese making process. And some of y'all can definitely get a hold of this from cheese makers. I think anybody in Australia, New Zealand, Keith, you can get this as well. There's a lot of cheese. This is sheep's milk ricotta. And I have it sitting in a bowl. This is a little, a nice trick. I'm sit sitting in a bowl with, can you see the um, saucer down in there? Hang on, saucer. It's doing that so that all of this whey drains out. You want drier ricotta for this. When you first buy the ricotta, there's a lot of whey in there, a lot of that liquid. So you want to let it sit in a basket or a sieve on top of something so all of that, um, as much uh, liquid as possible in any event, can leach out. So I'm going to just make a little ricotta cream. It's super simple. The thing about ricotta, if any of y'all have people who live in other places maybe need to substitute with something else, it's really spreadable. See how it spreads? So you need, you need some sort of a cheese that spreads like that. If you need to substitute, you can find something um, that will work. So this is sheep's milk ricotta. It's really flavorful. Let's see if I can get all that in here without making a mess. And I'm gonna whip it with some sugar. And what's really fun about that is it just turns into this beautiful, creamy, um, nice mixture. Um, I'm going to send you the recipe so you'll have the exact amount. I tend to use not very much sugar because I really don't want it to be too sweet. You can, this is a, uh, the amount here is one third of the weight. I, I had uh, a kilo and 200 grams of ricotta and I just added 400 grams of sugar. I really don't want it to be too sweet. I'm going to blend that. This will be loud for just a minute. I don't know if y'all can hear this. I actually just heard it. It sounds different. So the ricotta has taken in all of the sugar and developed that creamy consistency. So that's all it takes. I can't do this backward. Uh, I have to go around to the front. There. So 
So I'm going to flavor this. I'm going to use lemon zest. My aunt Francesca that we saw the picture of in Sicily, this is her recipe, and I'm going to do it the way she does it, which is adding lemon zest. You would traditionally add some of that candied zucata, the candied squash, but unless you make it yourself, A, it's hard to find, and when you find it, it usually tastes kind of medicinal, and a lot of those candied fruits you find on the market, those little chopped up candied fruits, they don't really taste very good. So I'm gonna do what she does and add lemon zest right here. She says the more the better. So a lot of lemon zest. You could also add some cinnamon instead of lemon. And you probably have seen this made with chocolate. I choose not to use chocolate because these recipes were first made in Sicily in the 800s AD. The Arabs, the Saracen Arabs, we talked about the guys who built the Medina in Mazzara del Vallo. They also introduced sugarcane to Sicily. They were already making cheese and ricotta, so they found ricotta, they introduced sugar, and they're the ones who invented these desserts. In fact, cassata comes from the word cassat, which is the name of the recipient, the name of the bowl that you make it in. And so the reason I'm not getting, I'm not adding chocolate, I'm getting to my point, is that chocolate was brought into Sicily after Christopher Columbus landed in the Americas, which was 1492. So that's a good um, 450 years later. And then chocolate wasn't common until probably the mid 1500s. So in my view, chocolate is a later addition and greatly post dates the invention of this recipe, so I'm not using it. Although if you would like to, feel free. Uh, let me get rid of this and get some space. If we agree, Elaine, chocolate is cheating. Chocolate's cheating? A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Everything tastes good with chocolate. It's I just a cheese way. I love chocolate, but I'm not putting it in here. I'm not putting it in my cannoli. So what I'm going to start with is making the layer cake, making the, um, the form of the cassata. So the cassata gets that great, funny, green um, almond paste border. I don't know what's going on around here. I was hoping my cousin Leonardo would be on the line, but I don't think he is. Leonardo, go she say? No. There's no almond paste. I can't find almond paste. I've been to every store that I'm allowed to go to in Tuscany and there just isn't any. So let's be um, inventive and I'm using this lurid green little cake of, um, it's called pasta di zucchero, it's sugar fondant icing. So basically what this is, is that ring, that border around the edge of the cake and whatever, it's green. So at least there's that. I'm sorry that it's not almond paste, but there isn't any, so I'm making do. Um, what you would normally do is take some almond paste and just knead in some green food coloring. I have some powdered green food coloring, which is what I added to this, um, and some liquid green food coloring. This, is, this was white fondant icing, and I added some of the um, powdered green food coloring to it, so you can see that color. I'm just gonna roll this out. This stuff is like modeling clay. It's kind of scary. I don't know if you want to eat it. It'd be way better if it was almond paste. But there's a pandemic, what can I say? Um, the pan, what you're gonna do is we're gonna lay, make this layer cake and assemble it in the pan and turn it out. So in order to do that, I'm gonna line the pan with plastic wrap. This dessert, um, It's really, really tasty. I think it looks spectacular. And it's actually kind of easy to make. And you don't mess up your pan doesn't even get dirty because you're lining it with plastic wrap. So let's just roll out the, um, I'm gonna roll out the green border.
You want kind of a long end strip. And then you can also make like checkerboard. You all might have noticed that in some of those photographs that I showed you before, you can do checkerboard white and green. I have a feeling this was originally made with pistachio paste because the Arabs were not using green food coloring. And I am all about natural foods. And this is the only thing in my entire kitchen repertoire where I use food coloring. I don't want my food to be funny colors. But this dessert is this over the top, broke decoration all over the place, and it has to be green. So just every now and again, we'll drop a food coloring. It's not going to kill you. I'm going to add a strip of, I have a feeling this isn't going to go all the way around. So I might just add a little piece of white, or the, anyway, the lighter green. So Elaine, have you ever made almond paste at home? Because we were Googling and apparently it's doable. I've never, I've thought about doing it and I've never done it. Lorenzo, have you done it? Sorry? I might have to pass the demand of in casa. No, no, I'm not a, I'm a chef, not a pasty. I, I don't make it. <laughs> I've never done it because I have been, always just been scared that I wouldn't be able to get it pliable enough. You have to have, um, you would really need, um, almonds with a lot of essential oils in them and then you have to grind it up in such I just I didn't I was always been afraid it wouldn't it wouldn't come out have y'all done it before Basha have you done it no no we haven't done it we just uh we're just not sure that we could get it so or either and so instead of I don't know I just like I prefer I preferred in this instance to just buy the um, I, I have a question. I'm yes. Elizabeth. Okay. For those in Australia, do you find, can you readily find cassate, you know, in specialty shops and things, or is it sort of a rarity? I'm just curious for those in Australia and New Zealand. We have some amazing Italian cake shops, um, pretty authentic, that we could probably get everything in. But uh, not not ingredients, more so the finished cake. Okay. Mm -hmm. Although you can get for sure the ricotta, because I looked online and in Melbourne. Yep, Aldi has ricotta. Okay, so there's the pan lined with the um, fake almond paste. And I've made a little lighter green strip on each side. Now I'm going to line this with a sponge cake. And I made sponge. And I've cut this is a sponge cake, and I've cut it into vertical strips, just for thin, sort of quarter of an inch strips. And it's raining today and humid. And my sponge cake is a disaster. Can you see how it fell in the middle? It's kind of goofy. I'm not very happy about that. But luckily, this dessert is super forgiving, and you don't see the cake at all. So I'm just going to go ahead and use my terrible looking sponge cake. I'm gonna line the bottom and the sides. Um, and then we'll put the ricotta filling in. And after it's decorated, nobody will know what a mess this sponge cake is. It still tastes good. So I'm just gonna how, how thick how thick does it need to be cut the it's about cake. a quarter of an inch about a quarter of an inch a quarter of an inch okay and I'm putting it together like a puzzle piece you know I I just just kind of where there's a where there's a blank spot just shove a piece in it does not need to be pretty no one's gonna see this. Okay, let's see. This cake is, um, look at this cake. It's a mess. I'm gonna use, let's see. Okay, I'm gonna take a nicer even piece to go around that edge. Okay, 
So I'm just, again, fit this in like a puzzle piece there. And I'm going to fill in with the ricotta filling. And then, so you want to, we're going to fill it up with ricotta, but I'm going to leave some space at the top for another layer of um, cake. So that'll be, that'll be the bottom. And then this thing sits in the refrigerator for several hours, even overnight. And it really kind of, the, whatever humidity is left in the ricotta, kind of bathes the sponge and it really turns into a kind of a cohesive unit. So you, want, you don't want to take it apart too soon or it might just, uh, might just go blop. Okay, so now I'm going to cover the bottom. One more layer of cake, sponge my pathetic sponge. I'm trying to avoid the goopy bits, which is why I'm cutting this up into a million pieces. I also made a whole nother cake though. I probably should just be using this. In fact, I will. So this is the box is going to be the bottom of the cake. And again, it just doesn't matter one bit what it looks like. So I'm just again filling it in like the puzzle pieces. I'm trying to make, every, to make sure all of the ricotta is covered up. And so as it sits in the fridge, There, it kind of it will compact a little bit, so it's a little bit coming up over the top of the um, pie dish. But it will compact, and then we're going to flip it out, and it's the other side that we're going to decorate that becomes the top. So cover it up, go with plastic wrap, and so this just goes into the fridge and sits for, like I said, overnight, six hours maybe for overnight. I, of course, have planned ahead. So let me go swap it out. I'm gonna put this in the fridge and get one that's ready to decorate. And I'm gonna keep this in the refrigerator as well. When you're making cannoli, when you're just, you're just making cannoli, when you make the filling, you wanna let it sit for a bit before you um, fill the cannoli because that way the sugar kind of um, melts into the ricotta. You don't want to use this right away anyway. It needs to sit in the fridge for a bit. So here is a Passata that's ready to go. I'm going to turn it out onto my cake dish and we're going to start decorating it. It's kind of like, it's probably slightly nerve wracking. Hopefully, it turned out. So there's Beautiful. Perfecto. <laughs> yeah, it's so easy when you make it a line. That's lovely. I want a piece now. Um, okay, so this this is again that's so you see I just filled in with the sort of puzzle piece of the sponge cake. Um, what happens now is it gets a white glaze and then all of that candy fruit on top. The glaze needs to set a little bit, so I'm gonna go ahead and do the glaze right now. Put that on, then I'll move, I'll move this inside and we'll proceed with the cannoli. The glaze in this case is powdered sugar and lemon juice. And I've decided to do that because I use the lemon zest in the filling. Um, if you had used some other um, flavoring, you might just use milk to make your glaze. Gracias. That was an Amazon delivery. 
Okay, I'm just gonna make a little glaze here with, again, powdered sugar and lemon juice. And I want it to be pretty thick. Powdered sugar, as y'all may know, absorbs liquid immediately. And I don't want to add too much. I'm adding it a little bit at a time because if it's too runny, it'll just run right off. Elaine, you can, you can mix orange zest or orange juice and lemon zest? You could as well, yes. Up to you. Although I would only use the orange juice if you put orange zest in the ricotta, that would also be very, very good. Okay, so I'm making a really thick glaze here. I don't want the glaze to be so loose that it runs off, and I don't want it to be so loose that it just soaks into the cake and disappears. I want it to make a nice white topping that will really set off all of the candied fruits that we're about to put on it. I'm trying to get out, there's a little bit of a few wants in my powdered sugar. I suppose I could have sifted it. Okay. So here's a little trick. If you loosen up the edges of the, um, the fake almond paste, the icing, the glaze tends to go down the sides on the inside instead of running down the outside. It acts like a barrier. So I'm just bending them out of the way a little bit. It just helps keep it neater. Okay. And I made a little extra glaze, so I may really not need it. But just in case, I made some. So see how that border, the green border is kind of stopping the flow of the glaze? The glaze is really runny. I mean, it's a, I made a thick glaze, but it's still really runny. So by pulling that border, the green border around, it helps kind of just kind of acts as a stopper for the, for the glaze, which otherwise would just run over and dribble down the side and you wanna keep it neat. So one more little bit. Okay, I'm going to let this set for a moment. The glaze will kind of form a little film on top and that'll hold the candied fruit that we're going to decorate it with. I don't want to do that right away. If I put it on, I put the candied fruit on right away, it'll just kind of sink in. So I'm going to let that glaze form kind of a little film that will hold the um, the decorations. I hope that doesn't run over after all that. Okay, all right, so that's getting there. We'll just set that aside, let it rest, and I'm gonna get going with the cannoli. So the cannoli, again, same filling, but has, um, you know, the tube shell. So we're gonna make that. It's kind of a funny little dough. And it has sugar, which is in the bowl already. And you mix in Marsala wine, very Sicilian. If you don't have Marsala, you can use red wine, white wine. I used rosé last week, because that's what I had in the house. Um, you can also just use vinegar. You don't have to be very picky about it. Um, two tablespoons of olive oil. Um, my aunt, I've adapted my aunt's recipe a little bit. She actually uses strutto, which is lard. And I am going to fry these shells, but just to try to make them slightly healthier, I do it with olive oil. And then, look, a tablespoon of coffee. Interesting. And then an egg yolk. And we're going to use the... Um, white of the egg 
I'm going to use to help, you'll see in a moment, uh, seal the shells, but the yolk is going to go into the dough. So I've saved the white because we'll, we'll be needing that in a minute. So just mix up. The liquids. Elaine, have you ever tried this with any gluten free flour? That is a good question. I have not tried it with gluten free flour. I'm using a just regular flour here. Um, trying to think what you might use. It, oh, there's no reason why it would not work because we're not taking advantage of the gluten in this flour in any event. Um, we're not developing the gluten strands. And there's egg in here, which helps hold it all together. Um, so you should be able to use, um, trying to think, you might use, um, what do you normally use? Almond flour? Do you have a gluten? Well, it's, just a, it's just a mixture that you buy from the store. It's gluten-free flour. They don't really, well, they probably okay. do. Um, that right. Let me yeah. tell you what I think about that. I'm going I'm to give you my honest opinion, okay? Yeah. What did they do to get the gluten out? That kind of makes me nervous. <laughs> no, it's, it's a blend of all these other, like tapioca or whatever. I don't know. Uh, maybe so. Yeah. Well, I, I would, and I would choose. I would like. I would go for maybe um, an almond flour. Or you might think this sounds funny, but you might use chickpea flour. And there are several Sicilian desserts that are made with ch a chickpea flour covering, or even chickpea mixed in with chocolate. Um, you don't actually, it doesn't taste like chickpeas. You, just, you know, it just sort of forms the shell. So you might try that. I would be tempted to try that. In fact, I think I will try that. All right, I'm gonna knead this. So I just made this nice little soft dough. And it's super, it's been raining this morning. It's super humid outside and this dough is really wet. Um, so I'm gonna add a little bit of flour. You know, flour just acts differently according to the weather. So I can see that I think this is really needs a little help. So let me get some flour. This is hard wheat flour. Hope this works out okay. We're about to find it on then. So you want a consistent dough that's a little bit elastic. Where's mine? But not sticky. Elaine, are the, are the cannoli also Arab? Yes, they were invented in that same time period. So um, supposedly they were invented in a harem somewhere. I don't know about that, but I don't know if that's true. Um, I have a feeling that's myth. But um, the when the Arabs invaded Sicily, they came in. I think it was 831 AD was their first incursion into Western Sicily um, through Marsala, Marsala, and brought with them lots of foods. I think they even brought citrus in. Isn't that right, Jenny? I think so. <laughs> For sure, I actually brought in citrus, um, as well as sort of various other ingredients that are now um, standard to Sicilian cuisine. So both of these desserts come from that time period. Although, like I said before, this is a nice dough. I'm going to run it through here, and I may. This is a pasta machine. Y'all may have one of these at home. So you could use a rolling pin, but it's hard to get it. Um, really smooth and even. And so I'm gonna use the pasta machine. You don't have to use a pasta machine for this. Um, I'm doing it again, I'm following my aunt's exact instructions and she uses a pasta machine. So I'm gonna use one too. Um, so let's see how this goes. I'm gonna make myself some room. So cheese had been, they've been making cheese in Sicily since literally um, 
at least sort of 1500 BC, I think. Um, Homerian, you know, Homer, Homer's legends, Ulysses, and all of that. Um, he actually talks about Polyphemus being a cheesemaker. He's the guy who was living in caves on Mount Hedda. So the first couple times you run this through, it's kind of messy and raggedy and it falls apart. You just kind of tap it together and just keep running it through. And it ought not stick. If it sticks, add some flour. And this is already feeling sticky. I'm going to add some more flour. And then when it starts to feel like a nice dough, these, there are two rollers in here. You, can, you, and the, you move the rollers closer and closer and closer together to kind of lengthen out, stretch, um, and roll out the dough. So that's what I'm going to start doing. And it still feels sticky. I'm going to give it some more flour. You can just run it through just like this. And that helps the dough not stick to the rollers. And it also the dough absorbs all that flour, so it just gives it a little bit better consistency. I'm going to try this one more, get a nice kind of consistent thin piece of dough. Isn't that pretty? So I'm going to make two different kinds of cannoli here. Cannoli are the tubes that were originally wrapped around a piece of bamboo, which is called kanna. So the piece of kanna makes cannoli. We're going to make some of those. I'm also going to make kind of a countryside version that my aunt makes. And in Poggioriale, they call them coppetede. I'm pricking it. That helps uh, the consistency of the final dough, the final tube, the final shell, excuse me. Makes it sort of crispier when it's fried. So the coppetede is a sandwich version. You make two little cups and you put it together and you make a sandwich. So I'm just going to use a cookie cutter. So Elaine, we went to the hardware store and got some dowel cut. Do you think that's going to cut, do the job? You got some what? We, we've got some like pieces of round wood got cut out. <gasps> no. If that's how that's going to work in the hot oil. Lorenzo, what do you oh. think? You see that? Some pezzi di legno che vogliono mettere usare per la... I don't think know if that's going to work because I have a feeling it's going to sink to the bottom and you need these things to float in the oil. If they sink uh. to the bottom, they just burn on the bottom. Is that oh, no. Okay. This is a disaster. It's all good. We'll, right, we'll find a new plan. What about foil? Can we make them out of foil? Um... You can order these online. I think you can find them. Cannoli tubes. I spent three euro and fifty cents. So I would recommend that also because they're hollow. And so the oil goes in there and it actually cooks all sides of the dough. Or you can just make these. So we're going to fry these and it's going to make this little sandwich. And that's what my aunt does in the countryside. And they're very quaint and cute. So you don't really have to worry about it. But I don't know. I would use definitely something that's hollow made out of something that will hold its shape and stand up to the hot oil because that could be kind of an issue. Um, again, and, and also it's for the flavor. Come oh. For the flavor. If you use a wood or uh, anything else uh, like wood. Good point. So yeah, the wood might give some flavor off, especially when it gets that hot, you might not want that. So I'm gonna um, cut these into squares, more or less 10 centimeters. You don't have to be too precise. Just whatever, square. And I'm gonna roll it around, square-ish that is, this is kind of a rectangle. I'm gonna roll it around to the pastry tube and I'm gonna be really careful to, I'm gonna seal it up with some of that egg white that I saved, but try not to get the egg white on the tube because you have to be able to get the, the tube out later, right? So you don't want these things stuck so good that you can't get the metal out. You have to be able to slide that metal tube out. Okay, there we go. All right, I'm going to go and take these into the kitchen where the oil is heating up and then I'm going to come back and get y'all and bring you into the kitchen too.
it's not very important, but if you have a, a marble, marble table like Elaine one, it's better. I'll plan my renovations now, Lorenzo. I usually use a wood table over my top, but marble is better. How come, how come you need a marble table? Why do you feel that makes it superior? Because it, not only is it really smooth, it's cool. So your dough doesn't just get hot and melt or stick. Okay, we're gonna go, we're now in my dining room. I think y'all gotten a good look at that. We're gonna go into the kitchen. And this is my house. I live in this old farmer house. So here's one of the doors that goes out into the garden. That, their, their fields literally started right out the door like that. So here's the kitchen, front door that y'all saw before. Let's see. Va bene, Lorenzo? Abbassa un po' ancora, abbassa un po' lo schermo. Vai, così, perfetto. Okay, so I had this oil on that entire time that I was talking, and it may be too hot, we're about to find out. I just moved it off the heat so it can cool down a little bit. Oil to fry needs to be about 350 centigrade. No, 350 Fahrenheit, 170, 180 Celsius. If it's too low, uh, it will take too long to cook. You'll end up with kind of um, flabby, a flabby dough that has absorbed a lot of oil. You don't want that. If it's too high, it'll just burn right away, and that's no fun either. So actually, this looks pretty good. It's right up to 170. It's coming up to 180. We're good to go. It's slightly hot. I'm going to let it cool off one second just because I don't want to burn these things. I'm going to let it cool just a bit. So I'll show you my kitchen while we're waiting. So this is, um, again, one of those farmer houses where the tenant farmers lived back in the day. And um, this is literally where they cooked. And, but they cooked over the fireplace. So you can see they had, um, they lit the fire and then they, the pot up there is where they would boil things and they even had a burner. This was their burner. Isn't that great? So they put the coals. Can y'all see that? Yeah. And then the coals fell down here. So I still get to cook over the fireplace. I do that obviously more in the winter. It makes more sense. Okay, did I move my screen, Lorenzo? Va bene, va bene. Okay, vediamo questo. Okay, it's getting back up to 170, so that's perfect. I'm going to try it though with a little piece of dough, which I didn't bring in here with me. I'm, gonna go grab, I'm just going to go grab a tiny piece of dough and I'm going to test the um, temperature. So I'm going to test the temperature by putting in just a little piece of a little scrap of the, the, of the dough. And it looks really good. It's floated to the top and sizzling. I'll show you all that in a minute. I'm going to put these in first. Elaine, can I ask you a question? Yes. What oil is preferred? Okay, I would literally prefer to use olive oil. But you have to use such a quantity that I admit that I've used sunflower oil here. If I'm making something where the point of the dish is the whole fried thing, I will use olive oil. But I've gone ahead just to use sunflower, honestly, to be kind of economical here. It's just the, the main point of the recipe is the ricotta. So again, if I've gone for the green food coloring, which is not like me, and sunflower oil is not like me either, but I'm doing it. Okay, I'm turning these over. You want them to get kind of uh, golden. And I'm going to go ahead and put these in, and I'll show you the inside of the pot. You want to be really careful here that the little corners don't turn up like this because then you won't be able to get the metal pot, the metal tube out of the shell. So I'm going to drop it in. 
and hope that doesn't happen. So you don't want to overcrowd the pot because A, the oil will lose temperature, and B, if it's crowded, you run the risk of these little corners coming in and blocking the, the, uh, the metal piece when you're trying to get it out later. All right, these are done. So this is the little cups to make the sandwich version. And then the tubes are in here, frying away. I'm gonna show you what it looks like. So just a pot of boiling oil. It's kind of scary. And, and how do you know when they're done? Is, is it, do they slightly change color or? They get, they get kind of golden like this. Bubbly. Sometimes people put cocoa powder in there to make them really dark. And I don't mind them this color. I think they're pretty, this kind of golden color. So again, that hollow tube, I think is really helping the inside of the the shell cook, so I think you might want to look for some of the cannoli tubes or just make the cute countryside version, which is kind of fun too. Yeah, we found some way you can get them. Oh, you did? Okay, almost there, just about 20 more seconds, I think we'll be done. So see how pretty golden they turned? This one went in a couple seconds later. I'm gonna give it a few more seconds. And this, you can save the oil too. You can just put it in, you can, what you would do to save the oil. And if you were using olive oil, when I use olive oil to fry in, I always do this. Um, let the oil cool. And then strain it through a sieve to any little, this didn't, this is pretty clean frying when you're doing these shells, but if there's any little bits of food left in the oil, drain that out. And then you can put the oil in a jar and put it in the refrigerator and you can use it again. And you can do that with olive oil and you can use it three or four times and olive oil maintains its health benefits even miraculously through that process. I'm gonna, we're gonna go back into the dining room. Now y'all are seeing backstage. Okay. Kazi? Anche un po' più su, Elaine. Kazi? Alzalo, alza un po'. Perfetto, sì, perfetto. Okay, so the cannoli tubes obviously are hot. They just came out of the boiling oil. So I'm gonna move on and finish the decoration of the um, cassata. Okay, I have a whole tray of candied fruit for you guys. So this is the fun part, decorating the, um, the cassata with all sorts of colorful things. And my trick didn't work. Look, I have a little puddle. I made a puddle of icing. I don't like that. I want it to look perfect. There. Oh my gosh. My little trick totally didn't work today. All right. So I have, these are, you can purchase candied fruits. I did not make all these myself. This is a piece of a citron, which is that big, huge, kind of lemon-like fruit. Um, this is a big piece of orange peel. This is lemon peel. I actually made this one myself. You can make 
Um, and I'm going to send you the recipe to do this. You can make candied citrus fruit peel very easily. You basically just, it's got a couple of steps, but you just boil it in sugar water. And then once it's candied, it lasts for years like this, literally. So that's for to have a little bit of yellow. And then I have some cherries um, to make a little bit of red. So let's see how we're going to do this. Um, I think I'm going to put a cherry dead in the center. And then like that. Lorenzo, hai visto se ho spento l'olio? Sembrava di no, che tu non l'avessi spento. Allora, I'm going to go look at my uh, stove top real quick because I have a feeling that oil is still going. It was turned off. That's like the CD. However, just had to check. All right, so let's see how am I going to do this. We wouldn't have wanted your farmhouse to burn down in Lane. Yeah, that, that would be and that lab on Zoom. That would not be cool. <laughs> All right, so there's some little bits of green. Can y'all see? Holding it up, not going to let it slide off. Okay, I'm going to add yeah. orange now. Where am I going to put the orange? Elaine, c'è un po' troppa luce, quindi se lo fai vedere un pochino più vicino, perché non si nota le decorazioni sopra dopo. Ok. I've gotten some technical instruction on the lighting, which is too much. I'm glad I'm trying to get this closer. There we go. Can y'all see kind of what I've started to do? I've started with... Um... Yeah, we got it now. Thank you. And then I'm going to add some little orange spikes. Where though am I going to add those? Here. And some more cherries. And I think I'm going to put in some little Um, pieces of yellow. I think we need some yellow. And then the last step of this is this great white icing, which we call royal icing. In the United States, people use it on Christmas cookies or like when you're making a, um, I'm gonna add some more cherries. I think it needs some more red. When you're making a um, like gingerbread house or something, you know that white icing that's just, um, I mean, it's almost like blue, literally. But it makes the, um, there we go. Okay, so the white icing, I don't know if y'all noticed in those pictures that I showed before, they, the little white dots of icing are so adorable. Let's see. So this is this royal icing, and I'm going to give you a recipe for that. You can also buy this stuff, just buy a tube. There we go. Um, But it's really easy to make. It's egg whites and powdered sugar, basically. And I just, they're just like so adorable. They kind of make the whole thing come alive. alive. You can make little swirlies on the side if you want to. There. One more go around and I'll be done. Okay, that's what I came up with. If y'all spent a little bit more time on that, you could even make it a little bit more elaborate, but isn't it pretty? Very pretty. Brava. Brava. Okay, so it's beautiful. I want a piece. 
You know where to get it. That's my friend um, Elizabeth. She's in Florence, which means she can have cannoli. She can have cannoli, cassado. All right, I'm going to get the ricotta filling out of the um, refrigerator and fill these cannoli, and then we'll decorate the cannoli, and we'll have our desserts done. Mm. We're so hungry now. We have asking Zoom to make a new feature to send you a slice of cassata. <laughs> I know, that's what that, that awesome. would be a job. Awesome. Definitely. I feel so bad. <laughs> okay, the easiest way to get the ricotta into the inside of those tubes is to use a pastry bag. Um, and you can just buy these, they come like a pack of 100. Just these plastic things. You can also just use a spoon and get it in there if you want to, or a knife, but it's a lot easier like this. So I'm going to go ahead and use this. See if I have something to cut that with. Hmm. My scissors are in the kitchen. One sec. Okay. So let's try to first of all get we have to get our pastry shells out of these two. And I kind of just like twist it out of there very carefully because I don't want to break anything. Perfect. Okay, so now we have our nice two pastry tubes and our little copete de cups. Let's start with this. So the um, the pastry sack, sack up, oh, she used to have to cut the end off. And these typically get typically get decorated with some sort of colorful um, decoration. I'm going to use pistachios on here. So these are chopped pistachios. Can y'all see? I'm just going to roll the. This is so. This is the copetendes. So this is what they make in Sicily, kind of out in the countryside. I like those ones. Oh, they look so good. I love pistachios. And then just roll pistachios, roll it in pistachios, that is. Beautiful. Pistachios also come from Sicily, by the way, so we're, we're on theme. So there's one of those. And then the cannoli themselves. Here, we're just using the um, pastry tube to, to fill that up all the way to the end. And then these are cute with pistachio on one side for green, and then a little bit of cherry right here. Oops. Do the last one. Oh, I lost him. Shoot. I'm gonna use the, here, glue them back on with the, um, ricotta. There we go. Gorgeous. Ready to serve. So, um, Elaine, when you run your tours, do you do, do you do cooking lessons along with the tour or how do you normally do it? I literally custom design programs to, for every, um, all of each different person. So if people want to do a cooking class, we incorporate cooking classes. Some people would rather just watch or eat, but if you want to cook, we can certainly cook. And a lot of times, like if you were, if you were to come over here, we would go in the morning, we go to the cheese maker and watch them make the ricotta and then bring the ricotta back home and cook with it. So you kind of get a little bit of an extra, um, um, little um, experience by doing that. So that's sort of generally how I program those things. But again, um, 
I can organize and do organize these persons depending on everybody's interests, on individual interests. Mm. So I hope y'all be able Wonderful. to. And, and is Sicily, because is that where your aunt is? Is that like your, like one of your favorite destinations or? Do you I do love it. So my family is from there. I absolutely love it. I just, culturally, it is so rich. There's just something about it down there. I, a friend of mine who's Sicilian says, when you first get down there, it takes you a day to kind of get acclimated. And he says, it's a botte di vita. It's like getting hit in the head with light. For some reason, it's just like everything, all the emotions are on the surface. It's a really, really fun visit. And there's so much to do. I mean, it's beautiful. Um, just to look at, the foods are amazing, fun music, the beaches are nice, all sorts of works of art, the ancient ruins. There's just, honestly, there's so much going on down there. But that's a, it's a really good, rich destination. And also for the Sicilian people, who is amazing. They are. They're very, um, very kind of warm and welcoming and outgoing. It's, it's really great. Culturally interesting all the way around. Do you have any more questions? Uh, Thanks for joining in. I'm sorry we went a little bit late. I very much appreciate Vasha again. I appreciate you getting us all together. Thanks, everybody. No worries. I, I wish I had more people. Thank you so much. You. It was beautiful. Yeah. We, we made a good first stab at Australia. That's good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's Thank good. you. We'll Australia. spread the word because we're not going to be able to come visit you for a while. Well, Basha, if you, I'm, I'm going to send you the um, announcements for future classes. And if something sounds interesting to you all, we can always try to organize, again, a, a, a session like this, which is at a time that's convenient for you. So we'll stay in touch and I'd be happy to put together um, classes that will run in Australia. Yeah, well, there's three of us here right now, but you know, when our restrictions ease a bit, we can have more of our friends um, together doing it. Cause I think that's really fun for us as well. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah, slowly, slowly, but surely we'll all be together again. But it's good to see everybody here like this because otherwise we're just closed up in our houses by ourselves. So. It's nice to see y'all. Lucy, absolutely. Lucy Ferry, I hope you'll make up probably and send a picture up to Arkin. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. She's a, wonderful. a friend of a friend. We have a mutual friend in Scotland. So yeah. who's a very good baker, by the way. No, Charlotte is a very good baker. She is, absolutely. <laughs> she's my cousin. Oh, she's your cousin. Oh, I didn't know much about her cousin. Oh my gosh, that's great. I, probably, I must have met you. Were you at her wedding? I must have met you. Uh, no, I wasn't. I can't think. Oh, no, I was living in Australia at the time. Okay, okay, okay. There you oh, go. Thank, thank you so much. I look forward thank to the next Thank you so much, Elaine. Bye, y'all. Thanks for participating. Thanks, Elaine. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Elaine. You're welcome. Elaine, can you say hello to my Elaine? Elaine, do we to say? Elaine, do we? Can you say Elaine Ruffalo, la mia mia. Io sono Sara. Noi ci siamo conosciuti. Ciao Sara. <laughs> Ciao Elaine. Lots of love. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Keith, are you Keith? So, yeah, I mean Elaine. Elaine's been doing her own art historian. Um, you know, virtual uh, talks as well. She's been doing Caravaggio and... Oh, yeah. I'd love to join again the next time you have one down in Australia and I can get a few friends too. Oh, that would be great. I will... Yeah, I'll spread the word. We've got a few Italian fans down here too. I mean, a lot of Italian descendants in Australia, exactly. Yeah, that would yeah. be... Oh, yeah. All right, we'll be in touch. All right. We'll figure out which one. I'll be dreaming of the cassata and the cannelloni. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't dream of them. You have to make them. <laughs> I can't That's wait true. to try and make them. Yeah, we will. We'll send you a picture. Yeah, okay. definitely. I love that. Send me a photo. All right, we'll be in touch and we'll organize something else for Australia, okay? Fantastic. All right. Thank you, Elaine. Good night. Thanks, Bye. Elaine. Bye. Bye. Keith, are you going to make uh, cannelloni? I'm going to try. I'm stomarendi di fame. So I'm going to go try. It's okay. Do it. Stiamo morendo di fame. Well, you have to watch. Send me a picture.
I will, yeah. It'll be from very far distant. Kind of. <laughs> but next time we make in Italian, so everyone speak Italian. Yes. Hi. Good Hi, idea. Everyone. You do an Hi, Italian everyone. lesson and cooking lesson. Buongiorno. All right. <laughs> <laughs> esatto. Sì, pratichiamo, no? Giusto, bravi. Good night, I'm leaving. I'm okay. going to bed. Uh, it's it's probably the latest here in New Zealand. It's about 10 o'clock. Oh my gosh, I can't feel. Oh, oh, nice. Okay, 8 o'clock here. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Lee. Um, Buona giornata a voi. Okay, but Sarah, that's so funny that you're a child key, so you sign off. Yeah, I'm gonna go. Okay, thanks. Talk to you soon. Thanks a million. Okay. Some kind of to make. No. Oh, uh, no. So, sorry, you know Elaine Ruffalo. I, I didn't, there were too many um, faces on the screen when you started talking. So, that's so funny. We have a